Hello there. Hello, Marion. Kelly, she reads a lot. Ali, and I'm sure there are many others here now. I only see the first few names before I sit down. I'm Gilbert, and uh, I, uh, I do these fireside readings every day, and I love doing them, and I'm very, very glad for your company. We're currently reading Wilkie Collins' is The Woman in White, which I'm thoroughly enjoying reading. These characters are great. Uh, he's really very, very good, and I'm really enjoying reading it. We've read many books together, 22, in fact, if you look at the YouTube website. Um, the 22 books we've read together are up there for you to listen and watch in your own time, should you like to. And also we have some fireside readings for sale, some, uh, some of the classics, Wizard of Oz and uh, Winnie the Pooh are up for sale. You can find them on Amazon and Vimeo and all of those sorts of places. Or go to the website, firesidereading.com, and uh, take a look. Um, but this is sort of the hub of Fireside Reading, where uh, I get joined daily, live at five, uh, by by you and people like you. If you miss a, a chapter, you can find it on YouTube or on Instagram. I was told today that Instagram, where you find it, is no longer called IGTV. I'm a bit slow with all this stuff, but somewhere on Instagram, you can find the readings that we do recorded every day. Uh, and uh, I think most of the readings we've done are up there too, so you can watch them there if that's what you like. Alternatively, for those who like the live thing, we are live from my wife and my living room. And I think it's a bit time, about time, for some more Wilkie Collins. Welcome to a fireside reading of The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. Reading six, chapter eight. When I entered the room, I found Miss Holcomb and an elderly lady seated at the luncheon table. The elderly lady, when I was presented to her, proved to be Miss Fairley's former governess, Mrs. Vasey, who had been briefly described to me by my lively companion at the breakfast table as possessed of all the cardinal virtues and counting for nothing. I can do little more than offer my humble testimony to the truthfulness of Miss Holcomb's sketch of the old lady's character. Mrs. Vesey looked the personification of human composure and female amiability. A calm enjoyment of a calm existence beamed in drowsy smiles on her plump, placid face. Some of us rush through life and some of us saunter through life. Mrs. Vesey sat through life, sat in the house early and late, sat in the garden, sat in unexpected window seats and passages, sat on a camp stool when her friends tried to take her out walking, sat before she looked at anything, before she talked of anything, before she answered yes or no to the commonest question, always with the same serene smile on her lips, the same vacantly attentive turn of the head, the same snugly comfortable position of her hands and arms under every possible change of domestic circumstances. A mild, a compliant, an utterly, unutterably tranquil and harmless old lady who never by any chance suggested the idea that she had been actually alive since the hour of her birth. Nature has so much to do in this world and is engaged in generating such a vast variety of coexistent productions that she must surely be now and then too flurried and confused to distinguish between the different processes that she is carrying on at the same time. Starting from this point of view, it will always remain my private persuasion that nature was absorbed in making cabbages when Mrs. Vesey was born. 
and that the good lady suffered the consequences of a vegetable preoccupation in the mind of the mother of us all. Now, Miss Faisy, said Miss Holcomb, looking brighter, sharper, and readier than ever, by contrast with the undemonstrative old lady at her side, what will you have, a cutlet? Mrs. Vasey crossed her dimpled hands on the edge of the table, smiled placidly, and said, Yes, dear. What is that opposite Mr. Hartwright? Boiled chicken, is it not? I thought you liked boiled chicken better than that cutlet, Mrs. Vasey. Mrs. Vasey took her dimpled hands off the edge of the table and crossed them on her lap instead nodded contemplatively at the boiled chicken and said, Yes, dear. Well, but which will you have today? Shall Mr. Hartwright give you some chicken or shall I give you some cutlet? Mrs. Vasey put one of her dimpled hands back again on the edge of the table, hesitated drowsily and said, Whichever you please, dear. Mercy on me. It's a question for your taste, my good lady, not for mine. Suppose you have a little of both, and suppose you begin with the chicken, because Mr. Hartwright looks devoured by anxiety to carve it for you. Mrs. Vasey put the other dimpled hand back on the edge of the table, brightened dimly the one moment, went out again the next, bowed obediently, and said, If you please, dear. Surely a mild, a compliant, an unutterably tranquil and harmless old lady. But enough, enough, perhaps, for the present of Mrs. Vasey. All this time there were no signs of Miss Fairley. We finished our luncheon and still she never appeared. Miss Holcomb, whose quick eye nothing escaped, noticed that the looks that I cast from time to time in the direction of the door, noticed the looks that I cast from time to time in the direction of the door. I understand you, Mr. Cart Mr. Hartwright, she said. You were wondering what has become of your other pupil. She has been downstairs and she has got over her headache, but she has not sufficiently recovered her appetite to join us at lunch. If you will put yourself under my charge, I think I can undertake to find her somewhere in the garden. She took up a parasol lying on a chair near her and led the way out by a long window at the bottom of the room, which opened onto the lawn. It is almost unnecessary to say that we left Mrs. Vasey, still seated at the table with her dimpled hands crossed on the edge of it, apparently settled in that position for the rest of the afternoon. As we crossed the lawn, Miss Holcomb looked at me significantly and shook her head. That mysterious adventure of yours, she said, still remains involved in its own appropriate midnight darkness. I have been all, I have been all the morning looking over my mother's letters, and I have made no discoveries yet. However, don't despair, Mr. Hartwright. This is a matter of curiosity, and you have got a woman for your ally. Under such conditions, success is certain, sooner or later. The letters are not exhausted. I have three packets still left, and you may confidently rely on my spending the whole evening over them. Here, then, was one of my anticipations of the morning still unfulfilled. I began to wonder next whether my introduction to Miss Faley would disappoint the expectations that I had been forming of her since breakfast time. And how did you get on with Mr. Fairley? inquired Miss Holcomb as we left the lawn and turned into a shrubbery. Was he particularly nervous this morning? Never mind. Considering your... Was he particularly nervous this morning? Never mind considering your answer, Mr. Hartwright. The mere fact of your being obliged to consider is enough for me. I see in your face that he was particularly nervous, and as I am amiably unwilling to throw you into the same condition, 
I ask no more. We turned off into a winding path while she was speaking and approached a pretty summer house built of wood in the form of a miniature Swiss chalet. The one room of the summer house as we ascended the steps of the door was occupied by a young lady. She was standing near a rustic table, looking out at the inland view of moor and hill, presented by a gap in the trees, and absently turning over the leaves of a little sketchbook that lay at her side. This was Miss Fairley. How can I describe her? How can I separate her from my own sensations and from all that has happened in the later time? How can I see her again as she looked when my eyes first rested on her, as she should look now to the eyes that are about to see her in these pages? The watercolour drawing that I made of Laura Fairley at an after period in the place and attitude in which I first saw her lies on my desk while I write. I look at it and there dawns upon me brightly from the dark greenish brown background of the summer house a light youthful figure clothed in a simple muslin dress the pattern of it formed by broad alternate stripes of delicate blue and white. A scarf of the same material sits crisply and closely round her shoulders, and a little straw hat of the natural colour, plainly and sparingly trimmed with ribbon to match the gown, covers her head and throws its soft pearly shadow over the upper part of her face. Her hair is of so faint and pale a brown, not flaxen, and yet almost as light, not golden, and yet almost as glossy, that it nearly melts here and there into the shadow of the hat. It is plainly parted and drawn back over her ears, and the line of it ripples naturally as it crosses her forehead. The eyebrows are rather darker than the hair, and the eyes are of that soft, limpid, turquoise blue, so often sung by the poets, so seldom seen in real life. Lovely eyes in colour, lovely eyes in form, large and tender and quietly thoughtful, but beautiful above all things in the clear truthfulness of look that dwells in their inmost depths and shines through all their changes of expression with the light of a purer and a better world. The charm, most gently and yet most distinctly expressed, which they shed over the whole face, so covers and transforms its little natural human blemishes elsewhere, that it is difficult to estimate the relative merits and defects of the other features. It is hard to see that the lower part of the face is too delicately refined away towards the chin to be in full and fair proportion with the upper part. That the nose, in escaping the aquiline bend, always hard and cruel in a woman, no matter how abstractly perfectly it may be, no, no matter how abstractly perfect it may be, has erred a little in the other extreme and has missed the ideal straightness of line, and that the sweet, sensitive lips are subject to a slight, nervous contraction when she smiles, which draws them upward a little at one corner towards the cheek. It might be possible to note these blemishes in another woman's face, but it is not easy to dwell on them in hers. So subtly are they connected with all that is individual and characteristic in her expression, and so closely does the expression depend for its full play and life in every other feature, in every other feature on the moving impulse of the eyes. Does my poor portrait of her my fond, patient labour of long and happy days, show me these things? 
Ah, uh, how few of them are in the dim mechanical drawing, and how many in the mind with which I regard it. A fair, delicate girl in a pretty light dress, trifling with the leaves of a sketchbook, while she looks up from it with truthful, innocent blue eyes. That is all the drawing can say. All, perhaps, that even the deeper reach of thought and pen can say in their language either. The woman who gives first life, light and form to our shadowy conceptions of beauty fills a void in our spiritual nature that has remained unknown to us till she appeared. Sympathies that lie too deep for words, too deep almost for thoughts, are touched at such times by other charms than those which the senses feel and which the resources of expression can realize. The mystery which underlies the beauty of women is never raised above the reach of all expression until it has claimed kindred with the deeper mystery in our own souls. Then and then only has it passed beyond the narrow region on which light falls in this world, from the pencil and the pen. Think of her as you thought of the first woman who quickened the pulses within you, that the rest of her sex had no art to stir. Let the kind, candid, blue eyes meet yours as they met mine, with the one matchless look which we both remember so well. Let her voice speak the music that you once loved best, attuned as sweetly to your ear as to mine. Let her footstep as she comes and goes in these pages be like that other footstep to whose airy fall your own heart once beat time. Take her as the visionary nursling of your own fancy, and she will grow upon you all the more clearly as the living woman who dwells in mine. Among the sensations that crowded on me when my eyes first looked upon her, Familiar sensations, which we all know, which spring to life in most of our hearts, die again in so many and renew their bright existence in so few. There was one that troubled. There was one that troubled and perplexed me, one that seemed strangely inconsistent and unaccountably out of place in Miss Fairley's presence. Mingling with the vivid impression produced by the charm of her fair face and head, her sweet expression and her winning simplicity of manner, was another impression which, in a shadowy way, suggested to me the idea of something wanting. At one time it seemed like something wanting in her, at another like something wanting in myself, which hindered me from understanding her as I ought. The impression was always strongest in the most contradictory manner when she looked at me, or, in other words, when I was most conscious of the harmony and charm of her face, and yet at the same time most troubled by the sense of an incompleteness which it was impossible to discover. Something wanting, something wanting, and where it was and what it was, I could not say. The effect of this curious caprice of fancy, as I thought it then, was not of a nature to set me at my ease during a first interview with Miss Fairley. The few kind words of welcome which she spoke found me hardly self-possessed enough to thank her in the customary phrases of reply. Observing my hesitation, and no doubt attributing it, naturally enough, to some momentary shyness on my part, Miss Holcomb took the business of talking as easily and readily as usual, 
into her own hands. Look there, Mr. Hartwright, she said, pointing at the sketchbook on the table and to the little delicate wandering hand that was still trifling with it. Surely you will acknowledge that your model pupil is found at last. The moment she hears that you are in the house, she seizes her inestimable sketchbook, looks universal nature straight in the face, and longs to begin. Miss Fairley laughed with a ready good humour which broke out as brightly as if it had been part of the sunshine above us over her lovely face. I must not take credit to myself where no credit is due, she said, her clear, truthful blue eyes looking alternately at Miss Holcombe and at me. Fond as I am of drawing, I am so conscious of my own ignorance that I am more afraid than anxious to begin. Now I know you are here, Mr. Hartwright, I find myself looking over my sketches as I used to look over my lessons when I was a little girl, and when I was sadly afraid that I should turn out not fit to be heard. She made the confession very prettily and simply, and with quaint, childish e earnestness, drew the sketchbook away close to her side of the table. Miss Holcombe cut the knot of the little embarrassment forthwith in her resolute, downright way, Good, bad, or indifferent, she said, the pupil's sketches must pass through the fiery ordeal of the master's judgment, and there's an end of it. Suppose we take them with us in the carriage, Laura, and let Mr. Hartwright see them for the first time under circumstances of perpetual jolting and interruption. If we can only confuse him all through the drive between nature as it is, when he looks up at the view and nature as it is not, when he looks down again at our sketchbooks, we shall drive him into the last desperate refuge of paying us compliments and shall slip through his professional fingers with our pet feathers of vanity, all unruffled. I hope Mr. Hartwright will pay me no compliments, said Miss Fairley as we all left the summer house. May I venture to inquire why you express that hope? I asked, because I shall believe, because I shall believe all that you say to me, she answered simply. In those few words, she unconsciously gave me the key to her whole character, to that generous trust in others, which in her nature grew innocently out of the sense of her own truth. I only knew it intuitively then. I know it by experience now. Thank you all so much for joining me. Uh, I will be reading tomorrow, Tuesday, but Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I'm going away. I'm actually going to a library conference to talk about um, fireside reading, which is exciting. And um, I'm going with Dreamscape, who I make the, uh, the fireside readings that are for sale with. And uh, we're going to this three-day conference, and uh, it's going to be great. I'm talking on one of the days, and uh, I can't wait to tell you all about it. Um, I, I'm sure I'll post some pictures, and uh, you'll be able to see that too. Uh, so, a reading tomorrow, nothing on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, resume Saturday, Sunday. Until I see you all again, everyone, please stay very, very well. <laughs>